Okay, so as Pat says, I'm the head of production programs here at Webster. I teach technical direction and lighting design. Um, I kind of stumbled into lighting design, but that's just a fascinating tale for later. Uh, my intention is I'll, I'll talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then ask you questions and answer whatever I can, see how much I know about it. Um, I design for the rep. Uh, so in addition to my gig at Webster, I design here for the rep, usually here in the studio theater. I've done a number of shows over the years, uh, a lot of shows here over the years. I've been here for 30 years, so it's been a while. Um, I also work for Shakespeare Festival St. Louis. I designed that, I've, I've designed that for the last 11 years, 12 years. Um, and it's obviously a little bit different from doing things here in the studio theater, right, where the lights are this close. And out there, there, I have a tower that's 187 feet away from the stage, so that's a challenge. Um, I also, I do variety. The chil variety, the children's charity, does a big musical every year, and I've done that for the first nine seasons. This year's the 10th anniversary, and I work outside of uh, out of town too. I'm getting ready to head to Alabama to do Sound of Music at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival for their their big winter show, and I'm really excited about that. Um, uh, so, a little bit about how we do it, right? I assume you go to see the shows and maybe you look up at the lights and you wonder to yourself, um, what, you know, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't wonder to yourselves, <laughs> how did this all happen? Um, but uh, for our students and for us, there are, you know, you'll go into a show and you'll see a, m a million lights in the air and for most people, I think when they look at that, they're like, how on earth do they know what's pointing where and how that all works? So. Basically, we create draftings and light plots. My students usually do them for me in my professional jobs where we hang a million different lights and uh, we're trying to achieve different things with them. And one of the things that we talk with our students about a lot is the functions and qualities of light. We so there are, the qualities are the inherent things, properties that light has and the functions are the things that light attempts to do to the audience, for the audience, to, um, to manipulate the audience essentially. Um, so let me show you some of those. Um, first of all, I'm going to turn off the work lights. I've been instructed not to talk while I do that because the camera doesn't like it. Um, and then we'll do a little uh, demonstration of intensity. My, my partner Nate is back there. Hi Nate. Could you uh, bring up channels one and two? and slide them out, back out again pretty slowly. Okay, so that we have the, the ability to manipulate the intensity of that light. Now these two lights are on here. We'll, we'll, we'll get rid of those in a little bit, but um, so we can control the intensity, you know, and, and it, helps to, it helps us in many ways to do the other things where we want to manipulate the audience. But bring them back to full again, Nate. And, um, uh, one of the functions that I'm going to talk about in a moment is visibility. That's kind of the, one of the big priorities for us, right? We want to be able to see the actors on stage, or not. So, Nate, take those out again. Bring up channel three for me. In some cases, where the direction of that light is, helps to tell part of the story as well, right? Is that at full, Nate? Okay. So. This backlight, because it's not directly on my face, and if I were to take these two lights out over here, you'd get a much different feel from that light than you would from uh, the front light that I just brought on. Take that out, please. Bring up channel five. Another way we can manipulate the audience right is to manipulate color. So color is our friend, and um, as soon as I bring this light on, you likely have a feeling about what I'm trying to tell you, right? I don't have to tell you what the time of day is. Chances are you're able to do that for yourselves. So um, take out this channel, bring up, bring up six, right? And if I bring this color on, it tells you something else about the time of day, right? Could you bring up, add channel four to this? We also have texture available to us, right? So that helps to cue you into uh, something else about time of day or location, right? You're probably, like, I, I hope that what you would think is, 
we must be outside now, right? That maybe that texture is coming through tree branches or whatever. We, the, the actual piece of metal that we put inside that light is called a gobo. And it has, and there's every gobo you can possibly imagine. For the sound of music, my gobos are church windows that I'm gonna shoot through the, you know, shoot across where the actors are playing. And those, and that texture helps us to tell part of the story. Okay. Um, so uh, take that out, Nate, take all this out. So intensity, color, direction we've talked about. Bring three back again and crossfade that with channel one. So direction is the next thing on our list, where we bring that light from. If I bring up a front light on an actor, the chances are the audience may not even notice it. They may not pay any attention to it. Fade back to three, please. But if I only bring up that backlight, and if I were to go flip off these lights over here, it tells a different part of the story, okay? And uh, movement is the last one. So there's the question of, Nate, can you go to Q1? And go to Q2? So the lights are changing, right? Go to Q3. Four. So there is movement for us. Okay, Nate, go back to the two front lights for me. Go back to Q1. There is movement in terms of time, and there's also movement in terms of space, right? So um, Upstairs, the way you would probably recognize that most easily is a follow spot. In a musical, they're chatting, 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 everything is perfectly fine, and then somebody feels the need to sing, and a follow spot comes on them, right? A big, bright spotlight. And they move around, and that follow spot follows them. I didn't bring a follow spot operator today. You must use your imaginations for this. But, um, but there's that kind of movement through space and through time in terms of how we slowly might fade up a sunset on the actors or whatever that might be. Okay, quality, that's the qualities. Intensity, color, direction, movement. There are functions of light, mood. Um, Nate, take everything out and bring up uh, channel four. So the mood of that actor moving through just this light, I think I'm gonna So the mood of this actor moving through just this light and occasionally having that light find their face is very different from, now add channels one and two, very different from them walking through regular front light. Bring up channel uh, six, add it to this. This is just a sunny day and they're walking through some texture, right? but take out six, bring back five, and take out one and two. Now they're, I don't know, kind of depends. Depends on what they're singing, right? But we're telling a different story. So we establish the mood. Um, focus. Okay, Nate, take this out, break, uh, ho hold on. Actually, I'm going to leave that there. Uh, take out four, bring up channel one. Uh, we have a choice in terms of the lighting instrument about where it's focused, of course, but we also have a choice about, uh, about the quality of the edge of light. So you can see back here on the wall that it's a very sharp edge to this lighting fixture. That's a question of texture of the light, the texture, the quality of that light. Um, but it's focused, obviously, from this direction, and I'm trying to focus the audience's attention to this place on the stage. Go, uh, go to channel two. This light, I've thrown it slightly out of focus. It's got a, well, it should have a softer edge. We tried. It should have a softer edge on it 
and we have the choice of that. Take, uh, take this light out and bring up five. Uh, take out five, bring up six. So, and this one has a soft edge beam of light. So again, there's a question of texture and a question of focus of the light. And last but not least, and probably most important, visibility. Uh, go to Q1 again. I'll be right back. Above all, I tell my students, and mostly they believe me, that it's about seeing the actors' faces. Because if you can't, you better have a reason why you're doing that, or the audience will feel like you've made a mistake. And as soon as the audience starts paying attention to your mistakes in lighting, you're probably in trouble with the show. Because we always say, if you can't see them, you can't hear them. And um, and that is absolutely true as our audience base gets older, right? It's true for my, my wife as well who struggles with hearing. She has to like get in the front row and see those actors' faces to hear what, what's being said on stage. So we, we talk about if you can't see them, you can't hear them. We try to really make a point of seeing those actors' faces. My student, this light is all at basically full right now. My students like to bring their lights on at 30% just to challenge everyone to see what your eyesight is like. <laughs> um, and I remember those days. Yeah, do it, Nate. If you're struggling for those actors' faces, right, and the lighting designer didn't do a great job, then it's, it's problematic. You start to fall asleep in the audience, too, because we have a little subject of what we call amber drift. Um, Nate, give me, uh, take everything out and give me channel one. So here's this light at full. I don't know if you can tell the color of it. Do you, do you, I, I assume you can. It registers, right? It's a little bit of a pale blue, which is actually, it turns out, more the, more the color of daylight than the warm that we might think. But So here it is, no color blue. It's cutting through the color temperature of my light bulb and making it a really clean white light. Now slowly take it down on the dimmer, Nate. And what you'll see is what's called amber drift, where as that filament gets warmer and lower on the dimmer, this light gets warmer as well. It may be easier for you to see if I have Nate do this. Okay, hold there, Nate. And again, there's some front fill here that's not typical, right? But, and then I want you to pop it up to full. It gets much cleaner, much crisper. It's a better quality of light. My students spend all their time picking gel colors, but then they run them at 50% or 30%, and what happens is everything gets warm, and the theater's a little warm, and everybody's kind of, I don't know, everybody falls asleep. That's a bad thing. We've done a bad thing. Um, okay, Nate, give me Q1 again. Questions? I'd love to answer your questions. Yes. So, um, um, sound of music has clearly been done many, many times. How much autonomy does a lighting designer have in the creation of lighting the technique for that particular show, which you see elsewhere? Or does the play come with, the music come with some lighting direction in it? Uh, no. No, there is, there's no, there are no clues that come with it. I mean, there are clues. There are stage directions and lines and all of that. But we, but it's basically they have total autonomy to create the lighting design. And, and the scene design for that matter. I mean, this, this production of The Sound of Music will be um, very different for almost everyone who sees it. It's two pianos, center stage, that's the orchestra. It is uh, nine windows in a semicircle upstage, huge 20, like 22 foot tall windows with nothing connecting them. 
They're about, four, they're about the width of that ladder and 22 feet tall, and there are nine of them. One center, four on each side. And so scenically, and that's, oh, and that's almost it. The other part that is there is that the floor has these gigantic buckles in it. It's a parquet floor, essentially, with gigantic little, well, big little hills, four feet, five feet tall, that taper from four feet down to zero. And I think those are the hills, uh, I think, is, if, I, if I understand correctly. And, um, and so, it's the, so the designer's being designerly. He's thinking of what are the, what's the essence of the play. He's choosing these hills. Then my job is to reinforce what he, has, what he has done and what the director's concept of that is. So for the church, for example, I'm gonna put these, as I mentioned, these gobos, these textured window gobos, uh, church windows, in rosettes in, each, in the top of each of these windows and shoot them through and use them in various combinations for, for shape and to create the space. Um, as, uh, so we start there, we start in the Abbey doing some things there and then as, she, as uh, Maria comes out for the first time, she's in the hill, you know the story. And um, she's, right, she's up on the, on the hills and she's singing the hills are alive with the sound of music and as that music swells, the lighting swells We've been in kind of a dark cloistered sp space with just these church windows and now that kind of dissolves away and texture gobos all over the floor that suggest we're in the trees that, that, that are familiar to us. Texture, warmth, uh, actually a little warmth but it's also sunset in, this, in the play and all that color and all of that texture just grows up as that music swells. And um, and one tiny little addition of a little gobo that comes from this direction called saplings, which is a sunset light. It's really, it's got a salmon colored gel in it and it's got texture and it's shooting through really low, blasting those windows with that texture as, as the spot comes on and she sings, the hills are alive with the sound of music. So I think it'll be pretty good. And if it's not, I'm gonna be so embarrassed. <laughs> but I'll be in Alabama, so. I mean, never see me again. Um, I have total freedom, in short. My students would tell you that's how I answer every question, so be prepared for that. But yeah. Can you talk more about how you do lighting design for Shakespeare and Park? Yep. Um, it's the most challenging thing I, uh, that I do because, uh, as you know, the, the set you know, is there, and there's a little rock wall, which kind of gives us a sort of proscenium, and then the set changes every year. But for the most part, it's always been in that location. And I have four lighting towers, one, two side light towers, three, four from the front, and a fifth tower that, as I say, is 187 feet away, and no lighting equipment will reach from there, so it's kind of pointless. But it's for a future idea. If they ever decided to move the audience out in the middle and go in the round, that tower would be important to me. But four towers. What's tricky about it is, there's only, the, 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 fit, the lighting fixtures that'll reach the stage, there are, there are only certain things that'll get there. And so I have to give, I have to design a plot. I can't do downlight. It's very hard, right? We're in the great outdoors. Um, I, I seldom get to do backlight because the scenery may not allow for it to have lighting fixtures mounted to it and shot from behind. It might ruin the picture. Um, so I sidelight the actors because those towers are the closest. They look like dancers almost. Their bodies are, sha are shaped really nicely. And then from these other two house towers, like these two fixtures here, I just kind of fill their faces out and maybe bring a little texture from there as well. And then I have to make 11 seasons worth of lighting look completely different for every show, but the plot is almost identical every year. <laughs> there really isn't a choice, right? The only a 10 or a five degree instrument will reach from that, from that, that distance. And I so I have to design with a kind of clever approach of the front light always has some kind of no color in it, but from the sides, I bring in these color faders. Actually, John Nickel from Switch bought us these fantastic new lights, LED color lights, that allow me to really shape those. So I have color and some texture and some front light, and that's about it. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned that the difference in lighting with the hard edge and the soft edge. What is the audience supposed to feel in those 
those two do. Well, right. Um, let's think about it in terms of a foul spot on a singer. If you've got a musical like Guys and Dolls, for example, where the foul spots are maybe much more a part of the show, they're not, uh, as opposed to Maria and Captain Von Trapp singing that song, When They Fall In Love, uh, must have done something good, right? We know it from the movie. It's not actually in the play, it, but we're gonna put it in the play. And so they're gonna sing, um, they sing that tender little song. We don't want that sharp edge spotlight out there calling attention to itself because we want it all to be about their faces as they kiss and all the beautiful feelings that they have. Um, but for Guys and Dolls, where it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit, uh, it's got a much different mood to it, we might like that sharp edge beam. It might just fit with the show. So that's the basic part of that. It's a little tricky when we go to do gobos because we have to make a choice about are they going to be sharp or are they going to be soft. Nate, go to channel four for me and, and take the rest out. Um, we have to make a decision about do we focus this to be sharp edged and kind of call attention to that gobo or do we soften it and maybe, we did, we did um, a head, uh, head of Gabbler down here, the Ibsen play, and we actually, all the front light had texture in it and we just, softened it ever so slightly so that people moved through the room and you did not think they were outdoors, but the soft edge texture played across their faces and you knew something was up. Something is not quite right. So that's how we play with that sharp, hard edge. Back to Q1, Nate. What else can I tell you? Yeah. So what would be a career path for your students leaving the conservatory? Um, uh, several different kinds of things. Uh, some of them are, th th first of all, they're amazingly talented. We get to pick f basically four or five students from all the students we see across the country over a given calendar year, and we see a lot of them. So those four or five are amazingly talented. Nate back here in the booth is a junior lighting designer that we, that uh, I'd like to say I discover. It's not really true. He found me, but. Um, from Bettendorf, Iowa, and um, anyway, they, some of them may just choose to go the path of the designer. They may say, I'm going to design as many shows as I can in a given year. That's a very hard path because to get enough shows together to make a salary out of it, like if you get paid 5,000 bucks a show, that's pretty good. Most people don't. Like the folks at Stray Dog and other places, they're probably only getting a few hundred dollars to light those shows. So, but if you were making as the, big, the big time money of $5,000 a show and you could, you could squeeze in 12 shows in a year, that's a pretty good lighting designer gig. And you can just imagine you're traveling from place to place, you're juggling three or four shows at a time or five shows at a time. And that's kind of what they could expect at, the, at, you know, at a pretty good level. You, maybe when you get to Broadway and you do two or three, like Ken Billington, who's a big Broadway designer, right, and you get to do the, your choice of shows and you have a whole studio of assistants who go and really do some of it and you get to come in at the last minute and, and say, yeah, that looks great or I want to fix that. If you could have a studio like that, you might expect probably significantly more money. But, um, but they also, some of them might choose to go be an electrician somewhere or a board operator somewhere where they just learn to control moving lights. And that, that can also be very lucrative for them. If they can run projections and, des and design projections or just program moving lights for concerts and big musicals, then they're getting paid hourly and that's a pretty good deal. So everything from electrician work up to the biggest shows that we've all heard of. So, what else can I tell you? Yeah. How many people are involved in putting on a production that would wrap in the lighting department? Uh, there's a, so there's the lighting designer. There's an assistant lighting designer who's usually one of our students who gets paid to do that, but those connections that they make are the real key for them because all the big name designers in the country come through. So, Lighting designer, assistant lighting designer, master electrician, Tina Beck, she's the ME for the rep, she's phenomenal. 
um, an assistant master electrician who helps her with practicals, lamps, you know, challenging things. And then um, there's usually a crew of 10 or 12 who hang the light plot upstairs. Every show, all those lights come down and all those lights go back up uh, in different places, sometimes, sometimes in the same place. Um, so 10 or 12 people who hang it, 10 or 12 people who focus all those lights and get them all where we want them. And then it comes down to the team of the lighting designer, assistant lighting designer, master electrician, and assistant master electrician to get, to get all the cues in the board and to get all that programmed. There might also be four follow spots in a given show, like a musical. Um, we think of it as a pretty lean team. Our, but again, our kids are, we're so fortunate here. I go, I'm going to Alabama, he said, well, we've got three people to focus the show. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and they're a big time professional theater, right? They, they're just not affiliated with the university. And here, our kids are dying to go do that work. They get paid to do that work. And as a result, everybody wins. So, interesting note about Sound of Music. Um, I told you about the hills that are on the stage. As a result, we can't move a genie out to go up to focus those lights because we can't get around the mounds. And I said, can the mounds be mo mobile? And they laughed at me, which is probably the appropriate response, which is usually the appropriate response. But so we can't get a genie out on stage to focus the lights. So what we have to do is hang focus tracks right behind the lights, like a traveler track, and put a person in a harness and fly them up in the air and track them along and e they focus each one of those lights. And there's a few hundred lights in the air. And I've got them you know, located on individual bars, but those, that, that electrician kid, he, he's, he's, he sounds like he's really good at it, gets in a harness, sits in a bosun's chair, we fly him up in the air, they track him along really slowly and we focus all the lights. So we'll see how that speeds us up. What else? Well, if you're going to go up and then take a light down and up again for every show, how do you connect it out for a theater where they're doing um, a different show? Yeah, that's a great question. So the rep has, like a, a rep show might have 400 lights hanging in the air. Yeah, because, right, because, now don't let me get off track here, but let me just say, so we have two front lights, a back light, two down lights, some texture, some other stuff probably, and this is one acting area. And upstairs on the main stage, there might be 30 acting areas. So, and, and an acting area is generally kind of an a eight foot circle, and then we overlap them, we draw another circle, eight feet, you know, eight feet, eight feet, so that we, every one of those areas has all those lights focused into it, and we bring them up and they can move around on stage and they don't look silly. Um, okay, now, you asked me a question, and that seemed relevant at the time. Oh, opera, hang, rep hangs 400 lights. Opera hangs about 650 or 700 lights. I know, that's the response that the electricians have to, like, you gotta <laughs> be kidding me. So, and they hang them just like every foot, basically, all over upstairs. And he uses some things in common, like these two front lights, he might use those in common. But he may have di completely different colors of downlight for a show. Sometimes they'll pull that color and replace it between shows. So that minimizes the amount of equipment. Sometimes we're going with the newer technology of the LED stuff, so he can just change color simply. He doesn't have to get people there to change it. But there isn't time to ref there isn't much time to ref Nate, how many lights do they refocus for opera between shows? Um, they refocus a good fifty to hundred lights every day before every show, to my understanding. I don't know that for certain, but that's about what I understand. Yeah. So so but that's still, relatively speaking, not so bad. Um, but but so they just have more lights in the air, basically. As the technology gets better. We're going to see, we're in, the, we're in that transition right now. I would say that it's really hard as a lighting designer to mix the new LED stuff. You know this from home. You have some rooms where you have those compact fluorescents, and there's a certain quality of light. 
and maybe you have experience, you've explored those L the LED technology of the light bulbs, and you're trying to, I'm, I'm gonna bet if you're buying those, you're like, let's buy the warmer version, not the colder version. You're making all these lighting designer decisions that you may not have not realized, but. Um, so the LED technology is fantastic, but the quality of those lights doesn't necessarily blend very well with all of our other incandescent light sources. And, and it, you, 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 would, you certainly have had this experience, I would bet. You've got your, a light, your, your mirror in the bathroom, you have a light bulb here and a light bulb here, and you've had the experience of, oh, I got the wrong wattage and this one's too bright. That you've done, probably, right? And then you're like, oh, I bought a compact fluorescent, but it's a different color than that compact fluorescent. And if you've done LED stuff, you know that it's, it's crazy. And they'll say dimmable, but are they? So anyway, as the new technology improves, it helps us in some ways, but it's hard to mix together. How am I doing, Pat? I think you're about time's almost up. All right. <laughs> OK. Anything else? One last question, anybody? Everybody OK? Well, think, yeah. Do you have, um, have you worked on any um, sensory friendly productions where maybe you have to have an alternate light cue uh, for people in an audience with, with sensory processing issues? Um, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I have. I have two story. I mean, I, I, we we always have you know somebody who's signing, and we have cues for the for the signers in those situations. I also had an assistant lighting designer one time who was blind. It was really an interesting project, um, right? We taught him how to use the board, but whenever the lights would he wasn't fully. Um, but when the lights would come on, it was very painful for him. So those kinds of things. But I, I'm not sure. I I don't think I have. So. I'm curious, just to follow up on that, how, how when you have to light interpreters, does that impact what you're doing with the rest of the show? Well, if, if I did a good job of lighting the interpreter, um, so let's say the show is basically happening here and that the interpreter may be sitting there, it's some simple things like if I lit them from over here and shot across, their shadows are playing toward the stage, and that's a problem. So I usually come way on the far side and shoot and dump their shadows this direction so that, and you know for yourself, once you've, once you've taken that in, if you don't need them, if you're not sitting right in their view, it goes away pretty quickly. You, it, it just becomes a little part of it, and, and you really probably don't refer back to it very often, so if the lighting designer do a good job. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Nate.